And uh, the Lord bless you. I, I want to uh, share just before we get into the message, the blessing that you are when you pray. You know, for many years, people have said something like this, well, just pray about it. Not realizing that, uh, and Raymond knows this, prayer isn't the least you can do. It's the most you can do. And the power does not reside in the prayer in and of itself. The power resides in the God who answers prayer. And that's why it's powerful. So during these difficult few days that we've had, uh, I lost a soldier. My dad was a soldier. I lost a, a dad who loved us to pieces. And I lost a dad who was a chocoholic. <laughs> Just a great dad, but I know he's with the Lord. Yeah. And uh, with all his flaws and mistakes, just like we have, he's with the Lord. And I don't think it's going to be too very much longer till we'll be reunited with our loved ones. Yes, so thank you again for all your expressions of love and especially prayer, prayers in our behalf. I uh, produced some sheets for you uh, tonight, uh, as I often want to do, uh, so that you could not only follow along, but in case you forget something that you may have missed, that happens sometimes, uh, you'll have something to fall back on. I'd like to uh, deal with a very uh, pertinent, critical subject. This is very important in the day in which we live. Many of you already know Israel has uh, literally been under the gun lately, more so than ever before. Even as we speak, uh, terrorists in Gaza and Lebanon are hurling projectiles, that's rockets, missiles, into Israelite uh, territory. And Israel is beginning its ground attack against Hamas in uh, Gaza. The whole world is bound together in hate of the Jewish people today. Something happens to Israel and nobody is not too many people, I should say, really care? Oh, so what? They, they deserve it. But something happens to the other side, and the news media is enraged. It would literally take pages to record all the various anti-Israel sentiments and writings and speeches, and we would literally be here all night just to enumerate those. But perhaps the most pernicious source of anti-Israel struggle or war comes from groups, believe it or not, who claim to be evangelical. I say they claim to be. I don't know that they really are. I won't even discuss the recent vote by the PCUSA, that's the Presbyterian Church USA, it was a cliffhanger. More than half of the assembly of this large body of uh, so-called evangelicals, and that I doubt, but more than half voted to uh, divest from three major companies in Israel, Motorola, Hewlett Packard, and Caterpillar. They said, we don't want to support them because they're helping Israel. Uh, the following excerpt I have here comes from the July 2014 edition of the Jerusalem Post, and they have a Christian edition of the Jerusalem Post. And this one is entitled, There is Too Much at Stake by Rabbi Eckstein. He is involved with uh, Israeli-Christian relationships to help out the Jews. And he writes the following words, and I, I don't think I need to apologize for 
sharing some of these things with you. You need to be aware. You need to know. He says, and perhaps that's why a new movement in the evangelical church today is so disturbing. A small but growing pro-Palestinian voice that in its rhetoric is far more anti-Israel than pro-Palestinian is gaining in numbers and is exerting influence. We see it in places we never would have expected. And then he lists four such places, high time places, where these people say they are pro-Palestinian, feeling sorry for the Palestinians, but what they're really saying is, we hate Israel. Here's one, Lynn Hybels, wife of Bill Hybels, this may shock you, founder of the large and influential Willow Creek Community Church in the Chicago area, regularly shares the podium at events with such virulently anti-Israel speakers as Anglican priest Naim Atik, founder of the Palestinian Christian group Sabil, one of the largest churches in the Chicago area, and the wife of the pastor is involved with anti-Semitic events. Here's another big name. I don't mind mentioning names. Paul didn't mind mentioning names, right? Professor Tony Campolo, a prominent Christian speaker and author, identifies Christian Zionism as a theology that legitimizes oppression. In other words, if you love the Jewish people, you are aiding and abetting oppression of others. Here's another one, a 2010 film widely screened at colleges and churches titled With God on Our Side claims to refute Christian Zionism, but in fact offers only half-truths and outright falsehoods packaged to appeal to Christians who haven't been exposed to the facts of the Arab-Israeli conflict. By the way, it's in the Middle East where things are happening. It's the Middle East where the prophetic picture focuses upon. It's in Israel and Jerusalem that God has his eye on. It's not the U.S., it's Jerusalem. And the fourth example he lists, the Christ at the checkpoint, checkpoint movement reduces Zionism to a political movement that has become ethnocentric, privileging one people at the expense of others. This was held in Bethlehem, not Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Bethlehem, Israel, right? These anti-Israel voices are present even at the most prestigious evangelical centers of higher learning in the country. Listen to this. Gary Burge, professor of New Testament studies at Wheaton College in the Chicago suburbs, teaches his students about the suffering of the Palestinian church in modern Israel, claiming that Israel practices apartheid. He also roots his contempt for Israel, not just in politics, but theology, admonishing Israel for its imagined sins while insisting that Israel is a nation that ought to know better. And that's what he teaches his students. Israel is the guilty party. It can't be any otherwise. And he teaches at a so-called evangelical institution, Wheaton College. That this way of thinking has made inroads into the evangelical church should be of concern not just to members of the church who dislike propaganda masquerading as theology, but to anyone concerned with Jewish-Christian relations. Folks, what is happening today is incredible because so-called Christians, evangelicals, if you please, are turning against the Jewish people. And that is sin. That is a crime. That is heresy. Right. Well, uh, for the next few moments, if I may, I, I'll try not to be too long-winded tonight. 
But I'd like to share with you some reasons why we should support Israel as believers. And I know that to most of you, I'm so-called preaching to the choir tonight. Because I know you love Israel and the Jewish people, and God will bless you for that. But the first reason we should support Israel is because we want God's blessing, not his curse. If you'll turn to Genesis chapter 12, a very familiar portion of scripture. Genesis chapter 12. I invite you to turn there in your Bibles. <clears throat> I'm sure you're familiar with uh, the first three verses, but let me read them uh, to you if I may. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you, I will make you a great nation, I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Some say that this refers to a blessing upon Abraham personally and directly, but it just so happens that throughout the book of Genesis and other portions of scripture, this blessing and curse phrase or motif that we find here has to do with Abraham's seed, meaning the seed of promise. And that cannot be Ishmael, but it has to be Isaac. And so this blessing and cursing goes not only for those that bless and curse or curse Abram, but also Isaac and Jacob, you see. Uh, if you'll turn in your Bibles to the book of Numbers, you, you'll see how this is carried throughout the Pentateuch or uh, the Torah, the first five books of the scriptures. Notice chapter 24, if you would be so kind to turn there. You can follow along. Genesis chapter 24. Notice carefully verses 1 through 9. I'll, I'll skip a few verses in the middle. But let's begin with verse 1. Now, when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not go as at other times to seek to use sorcery. You know what sorcery is, right? I can tell you one thing. It's not of the Lord. I can tell you that much. So you know what other source it emanates from. But he set his face toward the wilderness, and Balaam raised his eyes and saw Israel encamped according to their tribes, literal tribes, and the Spirit of God came upon him. Then he took up his oracles and said, The utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, the utterance of the man whose eyes are opened, the utterance of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. How lovely are your tents, O who? O Jacob, which is often a synonym for Israel because Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Your dwellings, O Israel. So it has reference to Abraham's seed, his line, through Isaac and Jacob. Okay? Now notice carefully what it says in verse 9. He bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse him? Blessed is he who blesses you, and cursed is he who curses you. What he's simply saying is, if you curse the Jewish people whom God has chosen, God will curse you. And folks, that's not worth it. It isn't worth it. Evangelicals dare not incur God's wrath. You know even Christians can get in trouble with God? And you and I don't want to be there. Right. So we should support Israel, first of all, because we want God's blessings, not God's curses. Secondly, we should support Israel because they are still and will be God's people forever. Now, we need to turn to Romans chapter 11 for just a moment. This is a passage that is often shunned by those who don't like the Jewish people or believe that the church has replaced Israel. The church has fulfilled Israel, they would say. 
It's called fulfillment or replacement theology or secessionism. And notice carefully in verses 1 and 2, Paul writes in Romans 11, I say then, has God cast away his people? And in the strongest possible Greek language that is available, he says certainly not. And the literal rendering of that would be certainly it dare not, may not, will not ever happen. It's incredibly strong language here. May it never so become. For I also am what an Israelite, Paul says, of the seed of Abram, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? We sang about him tonight, didn't we? Thank you, Pastor, for choosing that. How he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets, torn down your altars. I alone am left, and they seek my life. By the way, there were 7,000 others. Elijah was just not aware of it. Right. Well, when you come to the 26th verse, notice what he says of physical, national Israel, the Jewish people. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Now, Romans 9, 10, and 11 are very easy to understand. It's not that difficult. Romans 9 deals with Israel's past. Romans 10 with Israel's present condition. And Romans 11 will be with Israel's future. Now you have to understand something. God has a distinct future for the Jewish people. There will always and eternally be a remnant of Jews. You will never be able to eradicate the Jewish people. They are a forever people. Not all of them. You say, well, it says all of them here. You mean not all of them are going to be saved? Well, if you'll turn in your Bibles to the book of Zechariah, that's the prophet who is before the last book in the Old Testament in your English Bibles. Look carefully at Zechariah chapter 13 for just a moment. Zechariah chapter 13. And I'll just read verses 8 and 9. And there you can see what will happen at the end of the tribulation period. At the second coming of Jesus Christ. In verse 8. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord. Who's speaking? The Lord is saying this that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die. Two-thirds of the Jewish people at the end of the tribulation are going to be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. Verse 8. Verse 9, I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. Now this comes, this last phraseology comes to us from the longest book of the minor prophets, Hosea. So if you turn just a few pages prior to this, you'll come to Hosea just right after the major prophets, you have the minor prophets. Uh, the, the Jews don't call these 12 books the minor prophets, they call them the 12, the 12, that's simple. So it's easy to remember. But if you'll turn to the book of Hosea, I would like to show you a passage that forever there will be a Jewish remnant. Because what we saw in Zechariah dealt with the tribulation period. What we see in Hosea chapter 1 has to do with thousand years that comes at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. That's called, do you know what it's called? The millennium. The thousand year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth. Notice carefully verse 10. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be how much? As the sand of the sea. 
which cannot be measured or numbered. It shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. Did that sound like Zechariah chapter 13 verse 9? You are not my people, there it shall be said to them, you are sons of the living God. As a matter of fact, God will be dwelling on the earth among his people. Then the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together. It doesn't say the church there, does it, by the way? It says the children of Judah and the children of Israel. And appoint for themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land for great will be the day of Jezreel. God has a distinct plan for a remnant of the Jewish people for the future. You will never, ever get rid of the Jews no matter how hard you try because when you fight against the Jews, you are fighting against the God who chose them. As a matter of fact, they are called the apple of his eye in the book of Zechariah. And if you tamper with the Jews, you're tampering with none other than God himself. It isn't worth it. You're not going to win. Nobody. Nobody. So this is the second reason why we should support the Jewish people. And it has to do with God. Because they're God's people. But the third reason is because God and his people are inseparable. That simply means you cannot separate them. You cannot separate God from his people. Well, what, what do we mean by that? Well, it's, it's very basically simple because God has made an eternal covenant with his people through Abraham. And a classic example is, the, is found in the book of Genesis, chapter 17. And again, I would like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis 17. This is a, a vital description of the Abrahamic covenant. You'll find it in chapter 12, you'll find it in chapter 15, chapter 17, and so on. But here in chapter 17, listen carefully to what Moses writes in verses 7 and 8. By the way, these first five books were written by Moses. Did you know that? It's interesting that if you had a German Bible, German Bible, I, I, think, I like it better than the English Bible at this point, because the way they say Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy is Erste Buch Mose, Zweite Buch Mose, Dritte Buch Mose, Vierte Buch Mose. Do you, any of you know German a little bit? Back 50 years ago when you were in junior high? No. First book of Moses, second book of Moses, third book of Moses, fourth. That's what it is, right. Well, we're looking at the first book of Moses. Why? Because God told Moses what to write. By inspiration, Moses wrote it down. Verse 7, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants, and your descendants, after you and their generations. For uh, what kind of covenant? How long is that, I wonder? It lasts for how long? Everlasting. To be God to you and your descendants after you. If this is an everlasting covenant, then you have to have an everlasting people, if you think about it. Also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as a, what kind of possession? Here you have it, everlasting possession, and I will be their God. How often does God have to tell us that? There will always be a Jewish remnant. Praise God. Right. And notice carefully in verse 19. Then God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear your son. You shall call his name Isaac. Because Abram just got done saying, Lord, how about Ishmael? By the way, the Islamic faith believes that Ishmael is the successor of Abram and not Isaac. But our Bibles tell us otherwise. Abram said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Here's Ishmael, God. What, can we change your mind a little bit? God says, verse 19, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear your son. N-O. My granddaughter says to me, N-O, pop up. You, you know what that spells, right? 
I'm learning what Eno means. I really do. You shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with whom? With him. For how long? For an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. Verse 21. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac time and again. Because he will be the descendant of Abraham who will inherit through whom God will fulfill his promises to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and to his seed for how long? Forever. God has a plan for Israel. Oh yes, tanks may roll, jets may fly over, bombs may drop, but there will always be the Jewish people. I would like to remind you that Jesus, the Jesus you worship, is a Jew. His ancestry was Jewish from the line of, guess who, David? I think he was Jewish if I read my Bible correctly. Last time I heard. And from the line of Abraham, right? His birthplace and earthly life took place in Israel. Matter of fact, he was born where? Bethlehem. That's not Pennsylvania, folks. That is Israel. And the church from the beginning was entirely composed of Jews. There wasn't a single Gentile when the church began. In very simple langu language, that means that you cannot claim to love the God of the Bible and, his, and hate his people at the same time. You can't do it. Either you love God, you love Christ, and you love his people, or you simply don't love Christ. You can't do both. You can't say, I love Jesus, but then turn your back against his people that he has chosen. Can't do it. That's a farce. That's a lie. So let's bring this matter to a conclusion. We asked the question earlier, you know, why should we be supportive of the Jewish people? Now I'd like to conclude by some application, okay? How do we, how do we bless the Jewish people? Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. If you'll turn to Psalm 122, I would invite you to do so. Most of you are familiar with verse 6. I think you've heard it time and again. And it's a great verse, by the way. All of God's word is great. It's divinely given. God breathed out. Theopneustia. God breathed out. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Now, there are many people who believe that the peace of Jerusalem will come when the Messiah comes and there will be a thousand years of peace. But I think there's another kind of peace here. Peace comes to the heart of a Jewish person when the Spirit of God regenerates him. And I think you're not only praying for the millennium to come, I think you're praying for that Jewish person to trust and believe in Yeshua HaMashiach we sang about earlier, HaMashiach, the Messiah, that he comes to bow before him as his Savior and Lord. I think that kind of peace. Notice, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Where is that, I wonder? Have you ever heard of the Temple Mound? Have you ever heard of the Temple? Right? Our feet have been standing within your gates, O oh, Jerusalem. He's talking about the Jewish people here. You see, you could think of Jerusalem, well, it's the home of the three monotheistic religions. And if you take a secular textbook on religious studies, they will say, well, it's a home of the three monotheistic religions. I would like to say to you that David here writes of, or whoever is writing this psalm is writing about only the Jews. Because he says so. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem is built where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, verse 4. Who are the tribes of the Lord? I don't think that's the Christian faith, and I don't think that the Islamic faith either. I think he's talking about the Jews here, and I know that's what he's talking about. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Are you praying, interceding, thanking God for the Jews? You need to fervently pray 
that their eyes will be opened, that they will be enlightened concerning their own Messiah, the anointed one from God, and they will trust in him for everlasting life. Then they'll have peace. Secondly, do you speak positively about them to others? Do you promote them? Folks, a lot of bad things are being said about the Jewish people. While the World Cup was going on, and by the way, it finished this evening with a German win over Argentina, one to zip. But while the Germans were playing, while the Germans were playing at one of the games, there were literally thousands of tweets going through the electronic system with anti-Semitic slurs against the Jews. Thousands of them. The whole world is set against the Jewish people. And folks, when people curse the Jews, they are in for trouble because God pays back with interest. Watch out and don't dare do it. You're not in trouble with me. I'm just a humanoid like you, but you're in worse shape than ever before because God is the one you'll have to deal with and you won't want to do that. So speak positively about them. Folks, the Jews are not perfect, but may I remind you that the Gentiles aren't either. I just thought I'd throw this out. And for those that accuse the Jews with one finger, I guarantee you there are four of them coming back at the accuser. Speak positively about the Jewish people. Are you developing friendships with them? Think about it. Friendship doesn't only have to be person to person two feet away. Friendship can be correspondence. Think about that. Telephone call emails, letters. Fourthly, do you buy products and services from them? Think about that. My wife and I, we, unlike some folks, we eat meat. Some folks like vegetarians, vegetarian types. So that's fine. It's great. But we buy our meat from somebody who is Jewish. The owner of the grocery store is Jewish, and he has the best meat in town. Community market, I think it is. And No, no, what is it? Golden Dawn. Golden Dawn. Almost gave you the wrong store. <laughs> Folks, you need electrical stuff done in your home, plumbing, heating. You need to buy a product. You know, just look through the yellow pages. Here's a Cohen, here's a Levi. He is a Goldberg. He is a, you know, whatever the case may be. And God will bless you for that. And God will bless you for blessing his people. You think about it. This is very important to God. God places a premium on watching out for his children. They dare not be tampered with. They should be blessed. And finally, will you share the love of God with them? I hate to tell you this, but the Jews are very lovable people. <laughs> they are. You know why? Because God loves them. He chose them. He loves them with an everlasting love. And if God so loved them, if we go by the name of Christ, shouldn't we? Shouldn't we? I have a book in my library and I'd like to conclude with that. It's written by a Roman Catholic by the name of Flannery. And the book is a classic. It's entitled, The Anguish of the Jews. 
And as he writes this book, which is a classic book, by the way, it's well known, he weeps tears for the way the church has dealt with the Jewish people over the centuries. And he is full of regrets for what they have done to the Jewish people. My files are full. I could spend the rest of the evening telling you what's happening on our university campuses, what's happening in churches, countries, entire countries, denominations, full of hatred. Why? Why do people hate the Jews? I can tell you why. Because they are driven by Satan. And that's the only big reason. That hate can only come from the devil himself. And they belong to the devil. There is no way they can say, I belong to Christ and hate Christ's people. Pray for the Jewish people and love them to their own Messiah. And God will bless you for that. Lord, we thank you again for the blessing of your word. As we listen to the news, as we see the times progressing where Jesus will soon call believers home, we have a limited time of opportunity to reach your beloved people for their own Messiah. Help us to love them and pray for them. And we pray for their salvation. And may they know that there are some people out here that really love them and really care for them and will do anything for them so that they may experience the love of God shed abroad in their hearts as well. Thank you for this group of believers who love the Lord. Thank you for this time of fellowship together. We pray that in all things, Christ will be lifted up. This is our desire. In Jesus' name, amen.